Murray, welcome. Hi, how are you doing? Very good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Journey okay to Norwich today? Beautiful weather, comfortable seats. Yep, yep. Can't complain. Okay, so are you ready? I'm ready. For I'm the ready. first question. Yeah, yeah. So the first one is stage presence. Yes. Who or what has been your greatest influence in the performing arts? Wow. That's a really interesting one because I suppose you if you if you pull from earliest experiences through to stage experiences. So for me, I guess um being five years old and discovering a stack of uh, vinyl records uh, in my home, not knowing what they were and then sort of learning how to put them on and then seeing what was on them. And in there was uh, um, Prokofiev, uh, Peter and the Wolf, uh, um, narrated by Basil Rathbone, which was quite an amazing thing to hear. So it's stories with music. And then, then finding um, The Hobbit, uh, on vinyl and listening to that all the way through and then hearing stuff like the Beatles, White Album, Johnny Cash, folk stuff, but all of it telling stories. And I think that was uh, hugely influential, plus um, being read the uh, Oxford Children's Book of Rhyming Verse or Verse and uh, and hearing all of the Hilaire Belloc stuff in that and the Edward Lear and, and, and uh, enormous amounts of uh, other... Um, British authors that uh, that worked in narrative verse. So I suppose that's that's the basis of it. And then um, the influence on on actually being on stage. I think uh, there's there's been a few. I toured. I think I came to Ipswich a few years ago with uh, Julian Cope, who I thought was an amazing person to be around, just to to um, to, to see on stage and to watch somebody working amazing uh, stage charisma. I toured with um, Attila the Stockbroker, who's another famous performance poet who came from that sort of ranting 80s era and uh and i was uh, having a bit of a hard time when i toured with him so it was nice to get m mentored by someone who was older than me and had more experience mark rylance uh, asked me to write for shakespeare's globe and put me on stage there which was an amazing thing to be you know under his uh, um uh influence as well and and to, to pick up uh, things from him so to put it down into one thing it would be would be uh would be very difficult and I, of course then i guess you you have the you know the people that you study under so as a student at uh, um, Salford University I had uh, some some brilliant uh, um, teachers there as well so it's a kind of big combination I reckon he says swerving the question <laughs> we'll get an answer one day yeah okay so the next question all the world's a stage mm. what has been your favorite place to perform well it's a toss-up because the two places that I performed, and they're very similar in, in uh, strange ways, um, is Shakespeare's Globe and Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club in Soho in London. And, and um, Ronnie Scott's is a very, uh, is, is, they're both the same shape. So they're both uh, amphitheatres. Um, Shakespeare's Globe, I think, goes a little bit tighter because there's people just, there's people actually behind you. And Ronnie Scott's is almost there. But anything with that sort of bowl feel, it feels to me that, um, and the reason that I think I like it is because of what they, they called Shakespeare's Globe, which was the sacred O. And there's, there's supposed to be something divine in, in uh, performing in these circular spaces. And for me, it feels like as a performer, you kick the energy when you come on stage and you kick it to the audience and then they kick it back. And that's the game that goes on between a performer and the audience. But in a, in a circular um, or amphitheater kind of environment, you, it's like you kick it to the left and then it goes all the way around and comes back to you. And then it starts this sort of wheel um, of energy and then you can sort of stop the wheel and then start the wheel and you can almost if, if you if you're playing it right you can almost get to the point where people visibly go oh when it happens and I think from the sort of uh, Elizabethan metaphysical angle on it then the energy sort of spirals up and is uh, accepted um, by the divine and what is the difference between you know you obviously you're a stand-up performer but you know you're a poet as well what is that difference between, you know, when you're addressing sort of an entire group or maybe as a stand up, you're picking out one individual and feeding off that energy? You know, what is the difference between that? And, and is there any you prefer of the two? Well, it's interesting. Again, you know, you, you have to look at the, uh, the, the the arena that you're playing in, of course. I mean, if you're doing a, a, a room, a small room with maybe 20 people in it, and, and then obviously it's a far more intimate environment, but you have to extend that intimacy to whatever um, size of uh, um, a Place you're playing so for instance 
you know, I did the um, main stage at Glastonbury uh, years ago, and and you walk out onto a place and there's no back wall, and you look at you know ten twenty thousand people in front of you, and that's you know I think that that that's only, that's not even half full at Glastonbury, but still a lot of people. And you've got to make a communication with those people and there has to be intimacy. So how you communicate that in intimacy is, I think, best watched when you look at um, rock and roll acts uh, do it. And what if you ever go to a big space, you'll see a, a rock performer will just pump the front of the audience really, really hard until he gets some, or he, she gets something going on there and then that slowly ripples back. But if you walk out to a big audience and you try and play the back of the room before you play the front of the room, then everything just goes wrong. So it's understanding that you've got to build that intimacy with an audience. And in, in a sort of medium-sized venue, I always think I just go out and I look for the people who are into it straight away and I, I bounce the energy back, back and forwards with them. And then you can almost see the room like a um, like a sort of heat diagram. So you can see the places where it's where it's where it's going really well, and you can see people who've been dragged along by a partner or whatever, and sitting there with their arms folded. And I usually, if I if I spot people like that, um, I I just go for the nearest person to them um, who's having a good time, and then they eventually get jealous, and, <laughs> and they and they they'll. So I think a performer's desire is to take is to unify an audience and a, an audience's desire is for a performer to unify the audience. So everybody wants the same thing. And I think the key for any performer, me, you know, the way I approach it is that I know when I go out, out on stage that that's what the audience want and, and, and you've got to give it to them. Okay, so the next question. Yeah. Stage fright. What has been the toughest moment of your career? Well, that's kind of, it, it's, a, it's a really tough moment actually and it was, the most terrifying thing that I've ever experienced on stage um, was, uh, I don't know which year it was, it was in the 90s. And it was when the Tea in the Park Festival was still held in Glasgow. And obviously, or not obviously, um, many people may know that the Glaswegians have a um, reputation as being an audience that will just completely destroy someone. And, uh, and I didn't know that when, <laughs> when I went there. And so my job was to go on stage in front of between 20 and 40,000 people um, between every headlining act at Tea in the Park and deliver poetry to a big, big <laughs> 40,000 Glaswegians. What kind of acts are we talking here? Um, oh, God, and Nick Cave and... Oh, no, yeah, Nick Cave and... No, Robbie Williams, Kylie Minogue, who else was there? Terrorvision. Um, I'm just imagining Robbie, then you. Uh, Black Grape, who essentially uh, the the Happy Mondays, and they have a sort of orc following as well. And then uh, who was the other ones? There was uh, um, I think that's you know it's good, good enough uh, cross section of who who we were uh, going on in front. Diverse of. is the word I'd use. Yeah, yeah, and um, and obviously the audience is. Uh, reflected that so that the hardcore would come to the front to be closest to the act that they they came to support and so I was pushed out on stage and I walked out there full of beans in my sort of you know mid-20s I guess at that time and uh, and walked out there and sort of held my arms up and said good afternoon Glasgow and uh, um and I uh um and I sort of heard this chanting starting and I couldn't hear what it was and I could tell that, you know, and I was doing exactly the thing I said earlier that you shouldn't do. I was looking to the back and not the front. And I was, you know, I had no, no concept of how you approach a big stage like that. And this, 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 um, uh, this chanting just got louder and louder and louder until, am, am I allowed to swear or not? Probably not. Probably not. Okay. Well, they said something equivalent to banker, uh, but with a slightly different letter at the beginning. That's what they were chanting. And I, and I suddenly realized that there were 20,000 people all chanting that to me, like, banker, banker, banker. And, um, and, I, and, I, and, and then they saw, and then I realized it. And then I kind of something, a spring went in my brain and they saw it happen. And they cheered as they saw me buckle on stage, 20,000 people. And, and this, this, this hardcore of black grape fans who looked like war orcs from the Lord of the Rings, all with like, you know, and they were all, they looked like they were on drugs and they were all definitely drunk and they were sort of red faced and dehydrating monsters. And I remember looking down into the crowd and thinking, if I fell into this audience, they would kill me. 
And that was the point where they saw me go, and, and they all cheered. I sort of finished the piece, went off stage and, and just didn't know what to do. Just felt utterly terrified. And, um, and then the backstage crew, as I walked past them, also chanted um, banker at me. And so I just, I just um, sat there and just said, I can't go on. I can't go back on again. And, um, and, and they said, well, you've got to because you've signed a contract. And so I, uh, I came up with a plan. I went, I, I recognized that they were all um, dehydrated. And so I took a load of bottles of mineral water on with me and just sort of held them up like, you know, feeding time for the seals or the penguins at the zoo. And then I got them all to chant. Um, I said, I said, um, we're all going to chant this chant. And it was, uh, who's the banker? Who's the banker? Who's the banker in the white? And then the backstage crew came on and they all sang it to the crowd. And suddenly I sort of made this breakthrough in Glasgow. And and and, and the moral of the story, I was, I was told by the, the Glaswegian backstage crew, is this is a people's town. And you go in like that. You don't go in like that and you have to you have to make contact with the people and so ever since then whenever i've done a gig in glasgow it's gone all right <laughs> you've won them over <laughs> i did and then and then they said oh come and introduce the prodigy so i, I went out in the evening and i stood there on stage and and said you know shouted the prodigy and and the 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 lead singer of the prodigy just I, I was knocked to one side as he went in this um giant uh, um plastic hamster ball did you have you ever seen that? No. So it's like if you use the hamster ball, yeah, one of those hamster balls. Sure, yeah. Human size, huge, great thing, out over the crowd with him essentially running over the crowd's heads, and and Is that, that was Zorb, it. Zorb ball. Yeah. Zorbing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Is that what it's called? A Zorb ball. Well, we'll, we'll find out right. after <laughs> when I Google it. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, so 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 I got to do you know as a result of that, they came up to me after and said, "Would you introduce the prodigy tonight?" And so so that was the ultimate success of the whole thing. But it was the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me. Center stage. What has been the moment in your career that you feel defines you as an artist? Wow, that's a really difficult one because there's there's a there's a lot there's a lot of moments um, in there that uh, that have had um, a big effect on. Well, I suppose um, doing what I'm doing at the moment, the 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 thing that has um, defined me was from having been um, experienced something which I don't think many other. Um, people in the world of poetry have experienced, which is becoming an international media story overnight, which is what happened to me in 1997, where suddenly I was on the front pages of newspapers all around the world for signing this huge record deal with EMI. Um, the, the the backlash from that was so intense and my um, my ex overexposure to the media was such that, you know, I was, so I was doing a press day that I could be doing like 15 interviews and, uh, and, it, and the things that happened, I won't go into it, but it was it was a really, you know, for, for a young person to go through that and was, well, for me, you know, to go through it um, was incredibly corrosive to to who I was. It was also a, a huge lesson, which I, I still feel very grateful for. But the net result of the exposure that I, I would say suffered at the time was that I just felt that I couldn't do anything anymore. I, I couldn't write, I couldn't go on stage, I couldn't go in front of cameras. I completely lost the plot and uh, moved to a wood in Sussex and, uh, and, um, and restored a Victorian spring system. That was that was where I was at, you know. Just the height of glamour. Yeah, <laughs> just 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 working with mud and water for about a year. That's that's what I did, and just just dug holes and ran pipes to places, and was just all I could do was just be completely practical um, and physical, um, and uh, and coming out of that, and then I think what happened is I think that the thing was then Mark Rylance then called me and said, would you come and do something for Shakespeare's Globe? And I did, and, but I, you know, I was still shot. I went on stage and it was fine. I did okay, but I couldn't, I couldn't connect with the audience as well as I wanted to. And then BBC called up and said, would I start doing a, a new radio show where you had to write poetry? Um, but after that had happened, I did a performance at Ronnie Scott's where I hadn't performed, I think, for maybe two years and I walked back in there and I took a completely different attitude to performing because I my performing 
it used to be sort of quite grandiose and theatrical and it and just went on kind of as myself and and not knowing how it was going to be to an audience of you know sold out audience of Ronnie Scott's it's only about 400 people but it was 400 people that I really you know cared about their opinion and uh, and and had it gone down badly I really don't know what what I would have done I just walked out there and did my thing and did the best gig of my life and I think you st- I think you can get it on there's a version of um, simply everyone's taking cocaine which is online which you can listen to and hear the energy of of that day and I think just just actually being brave, I think, was the thing. Being being brave and going back and, and starting again. Amazing. Next question. Stagehand, what piece of advice would you give somebody wanting to pursue a career like yours? <laughs> Don't. Um, <laughs> so there's, no, a lot, no. there's a lot of avenues this could go down. No, I think it's... Uh, I, mean, I, I, I sort of jokingly say to people, um, make yourself unemployable. Um, because then you can't do anything else. So I think to actually understand that there is space for everybody if you want to do something. So the idea that you know that there's this sort of exclusive area that certain people are and certain people aren't allowed to be in again is nonsense. And so to be to be aware of the the, the narrative um, and the internal dialogue that one is creating about what one is doing, and casting that to one side, and just saying right, I'm going to go for this, and I'm going to be brave, and I'm going to do it. And to, and to just go and do as many things as possible and to and 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 to understand that um humiliation is part of the business <laughs> and there will be bad nights you know there will be there will be there'll be times when something goes wrong and uh and and the thing is that's where the bravery comes in is to just go back and do it again and to do it again and from those uh moments because they say for for without um uh how, um, without failure, how can we truly understand success? So you've got to fail. And so when you do fail, it means you're closer to succeeding. And that's, that's the way to look at it rather than, I'm going to put away my toys and never come out again. You know, you've just got to carry on. So I'd say, ca- just carry on. Okay. And the final question, the next stage, what does the future hold for Murray Luckland Young? Well, Sunseeker yacht. Um, <laughs> the near future, or the <laughs> no, no, I don't think I, I wouldn't even 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 if that did happen, I don't think I'd take that opportunity. No, um, just I, I think the thing for me is um, a great line that Bruce Robinson, who wrote with Nell and I, said to me years ago when I was sort of standing there in the midst of all that sort of um, publicity, was um, just do your work. Just do your work and everything else will take care of itself. So I just want to do my work. You know, I just want, I've got, um, I've been writing movies for quite a few years now and I've got a couple in the pipeline. I've got a musical theatre project, which I'm really excited about. Um, I've got a couple of new books. Just made a um, uh, an album of the Rattlesham Mumps with um, Arun Ghosh. I've been working with... Um, Lou Edmonds from Public Image Limited on a on a sort of punk poetry album, which we're all quite excited about. So I'm just trying to just keep working, keep keep the uh, the productivity. Um, I need to perform more, um, so I'm so I'm doing that now, which is good, and uh, and just 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 keep it flowing through the pipe because I think that's another great piece of advice I was given is, uh, you know, you what was it was it was it was a guinness analogy that was the best the best pint of guinness is served by the establishment that has the most going through the pipe so i believe that is the way you know this if you write 100 poems you're going to get 30 good ones you're going to get 10 really good ones you're going to get five amazing ones you get three hits and that's kind of so you're panning for gold and i think the thing is to keep going marquis smith from the fall was a great uh, um advocate of that and and I, and I think yeah just keep it moving that's what I'm going to try and do brilliant so that was the stages of my life how did you find these questions good really interesting yeah and um it was it was quite nice to uh to to reflect on on a few things and uh, and hopefully there was something in enough there was some stuff in there would be interesting to your listener stroke viewers absolutely now as a special treat I believe you might be able to do some poetry for us. Oh yes, yeah, of course. Well, this is, uh, so uh, we're doing the the Rattlesham Mumps here, and we're also doing the um, we're doing an evening performance as well, which is going to have my you know this, all my stuff from over the years um, stand up show. But I'll do 
a piece from the Radelsham Mumps, which is um, it's a 6,000 word um, iambic pentameter verse poem. I won't do all 6,000 words, but I'll give you the intro. And The podcast isn't that long. So. <laughs> no. Well, so, the, so the, in, the, the story is of a, it's a, it's a seven-year-old boy who inherits this huge house and, uh, and he goes back and it's empty apart from a hundred-year-old butler. And so I'll give you the, and, and then the butler says to him, isn't it strange how your family died in such mysterious circumstances? So I'll give it to you. I'll give you the, a little bit of the prologue. And then I guess I'll just keep going. And then you can fade it out when you get into your edit, when you've had enough. All right. Now, welcome, dear friends, to this sinister tale. Welcome the wind and the brutalist hail. See the black mare and the blackest of plume. See the glass coach and the bleak floral bloom. See the fine lace and the fluttering stall. See the twin coffin descending the hole, chilling the marrow with famishing cold of a strange little boy only seven years old. Seven years old, seven years old, he was ripped like a lamb from the warmth of the cold breeches of red with a curl in his hair thrust to the fore. Like a pig at a fair, down with them, down with them, down with them, down, mother and father, deep into the ground, and Crispin de Quincey de Kenilworth clumps on this day became master of the Rattlesham mumps. Good enough? Good enough. Thank you so much. <laughs>